Thank you. Thank you. Now you have your Bibles this morning. Come with me if you will. The book of Genesis chapter 9. The book of Genesis chapter 9. Before I speak this morning, let's pause for a moment and ask God by His Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts today by His Word. Father, we are grateful for the Word of God. Thank you for the opportunity of sharing together now in the Word. I pray, Lord, that as we share together, that the Spirit of the living God will fall fresh upon each of us. I pray, Lord, that as we listen together today, that we may be encouraged in our faith. May we be strengthened. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to live in these exciting days, days that are ushering in the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father, I pray that not only may we be encouraged, but I pray that we will be strengthened. I pray that when we leave the house of God today, we may leave rejoicing, knowing that soon and very soon, our Lord will return. Lord, I pray that if there be those here this morning who do not know Jesus Christ, I pray this will be an hour of decision. I pray it will be a moment when Christ will speak and a moment when there will be decisions made for Christ and for eternity. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Many times after rain, you look up into the sky, and what do you see? A rainbow. I wonder how many this morning really know why there is a rainbow in the sky after the rain. You know, raise your hand. Okay, for those of you who don't know, I'm going to tell you this morning why there is a rainbow in the sky after the rain. Do you remember when God created the world beginning? He created a beautiful world, a perfect world. A world in which there was no sin. God placed Adam and Eve in this beautiful world. Gave them every opportunity, every blessing. It wasn't long after Adam and Eve had been placed in that beautiful garden until they sinned. Up to this point, it had never rained upon the face of the earth. After Adam and Eve sinned, there was a, a, time, a period of time when man became more and more wicked. <coughs> And as the years began to go by, man became more and more wicked. And finally the day came when God said, I'm going to destroy the entire world by water. God allowed Noah to preach for 120 years. Telling the people, God is going to destroy the world by water. People failed to believe. The day came when Noah and his family and the animals went into the ark and God sent rain upon the earth. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights, during which the entire world was covered by water. Every living creature upon the earth died. After the flood was over, God made a covenant with men. Now, a covenant simply means a covenant is a, an agreement between two or more people. Two kinds of, a, of covenants. One is a covenant where one person assumes all the responsibility. The other covenant is a covenant where two or more people are involved in an agreement. After the flood was over, I want you to notice this morning, beginning at verse 11 in chapter 9. God said to Noah after the flood, verse 11, And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there come, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. <coughs> and God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you, and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. The reason you see the rainbow in the sky after the rain, God said, this is my token. I will place a bow in the sky. And when you see that rainbow, 
It is my token. It is a sign of my covenant with the earth. But never again will I destroy the world by water. Now that is a covenant made just that God is responsible for. Man has nothing at all to do with that covenant. God said, it is my covenant. I make a promise to you that I will never again destroy the world by water. And when you see the rainbow in the sky, that is God's token, it is God's sign that he will never again destroy the world by water. God has made several covenants in the Bible. Let's look at another one of those covenants in the 12th chapter of Genesis. Turn to Genesis chapter 12. And here God makes a covenant with Abram, who will later be known as Abraham. Beginning at verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Now notice, God says, I'm making a covenant with you. Abram has a part in that covenant. Abram's part is to leave his home and his family and go to the place that God will show him. Here's God's part of the covenant. Verse 2, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. That's God's covenant. God says, I'm making a covenant that in you, Abram, when you leave your homeland, from that point onward, I make a covenant with you, I will bless you. And in you, all families of the earth will be blessed. Now, there's an interesting sideline to this covenant. If you turn to the 15th chapter of Genesis, Genesis chapter 15, and what you notice beginning at verse 13. And he said, it is God, said unto Abram, Know of a surety, in other words, this is a guarantee, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them, how long? 400 years. That's God's promise. God said, my people that I'm going to make into a nation, a great nation, all families of the earth are going to be blessed. I'm also saying to you now, Abram, that this same family is going to serve another family or another kingdom for 400 years. Verse 14. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterward they shall come out with great substance. In other words, God says, my people are going to serve in a foreign land for 400 years in slavery. At the end of that time, they're going to come out with great sums. They're going to come out a very wealthy and rich nation. You know the story well. Generations pass. Abram's family begins to grow. Abram's or Abraham's great grandson, one of his great grandsons, name was Joseph. You remember Joseph had 11 brothers. Joseph's brothers ended him because Joseph was the pet of the family. To make a long story short, Joseph's brothers decided to sell him, and that, first of all, they were going to kill him. Then they decided it would be better to get some money out, so they sold him as a slave. And as a slave, Joseph just happened to be taken down into the land of Egypt. And there he was sold as a slave and became Potiphar's slave. Now, for about 20 years, Joseph lived in Egypt, and things went from bad to worse. Everything seemed to be going wrong in his life. But then there came a time when, when Joseph was able to interpret a, a dream for the king of Egypt. And the dream symbolized that there was going to be seven years of great plenty, followed by seven years of famine. <coughs> The result of that dream was that Joseph was made second in command in all of Egypt. After the seven years of planting, there became the seven years of famine. Now the famine became so great in the land that Joseph's family, who were living back in the land of Canaan, they ran out of food. 
And through a series of incidents, Joseph's family, including his brothers and his father, were all brought down into the land of Egypt during this famine. Now, when they went down into the land of Egypt, there were only 70 people in the family. They settled in perhaps the most fertile soil in all of Egypt. Things were going great. Joseph was second in command of all of Egypt. God's people began to grow. There became a great population explosion. The people began to grow by leaps and bounds. Until finally, turn to the book of Exodus, chapter 1. Exodus, chapter 1. Everything went well for approximately 30 years. During these 30 years, the nation experienced a population explosion. Now, at the end of about 30 years, drop down to verse 8 in chapter 1. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. <laughs> Joseph is forgotten. <laughs> the result is the king says, listen, this nation, these Israelis, they are exploding as a people. They're going rapidly. We've got to get them under control. So they place the Israelis into bondage. And for the next number of years, they were in bondage. After about 300 years, the nation was still growing even under bondage. Finally, the Pharaoh said, you know, we got to put a stop to this. And the only way we know to do it, we can't seem to control this nation. They're still growing. The way we'll control this, we'll have all of the male children destroy. And that way we can limit the day. We'll let the women live, the little girls live, but the boys we're going to destroy. About that time, you remember Moses was born. And you know the series of incidents that Moses finally became Pharaoh's daughter's son. When Moses was about 40 years of age, he went out to see his people. The end result was that Moses killed an Egyptian. And because of that, Moses had to flee the land of Egypt. And he flees the land of Egypt. The oppression became greater and greater as the Israeli people were punished through slavery. But then when Moses was 80 years of age, God spoke to Moses again and said, Moses, I've chosen you. I want you to go back to Egypt because I'm going to bring my people out of slavery. Turn to the sixth chapter of Exodus. Exodus chapter 6. And verse 2, And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But now my name Jehovah was I not known unto them. And I have also, notice, I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. Notice, and I have remembered my covenant. I've remembered the agreement that I made. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will rid you out of their bondage. And I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. Here we have a people who had been in slavery and in bondage with absolutely nothing. They've been in that bondage and that slavery for a little over 300 years. God says to Moses, I'm going to send you back and I'm going to bring my people out of this bondage and when they come out, they're going to be a rich people. You know the story well. Moses went back to the land of Egypt and said to Pharaoh, God says, let my people go. Okay, so I don't think about your God. He hasn't done much for your people. Look at them. They've been in bondage. They've been in slavery all these years. Why should I let them go? Their God is not a powerful God. You know the end result? God sent ten plagues upon the land of Egypt. 
plagues that almost literally destroyed the land of Egypt. And if you remember that just before the 10th plague, and that 10th plague, if you remember, was a time when God said the death angel is going to pass over Egypt. And the death angel is going to enter into every home and is going to kill the firstborn male in every home. Just before that plague was given, God established what was to be known as the Passover, a new covenant with his people. Now with the Passover, God says you're to take a little lamb. The lamb had to be one year of age or less. The lamb had to be without any spot or any blemish. The lamb was to be put into a pen for four days from, the, from, uh, from up to the 10th day of the month. 10th to the 14th day of the month. 14th day of the month, God said, I want you to take the lamb, I want you to kill it. Once you kill the lamb, you take the blood of the lamb, and some of that blood I want you to put up on the doorpost of your home and across the lintel of the door. After that is completed, I want you to roast that lamb, go into your home, and I want you to eat that lamb during the night with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Now this was the very night that the, the angel was going to be passing over Egypt to destroy the firstborn in every home. Turn to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. And verse 11. And thus shall ye eat it, this is the Passover, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Notice, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood, the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. By faith, the Israelis were to put the blood upon the doorposts. God says, when I pass over, I will see the blood, I will pass over your home, and death will not enter your home. Drop down to verse 24. Same chapter. And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and thy sons forever. It's to be remembered. Verse 41. Same chapter. And it came to pass. Great, one of the greatest verses in all the Old Testament. And it came to pass at the end, notice, at the end of the 400 and 30 years, and in my Bible, I've underlined the next phrase because it's glorious. Even the self same day it came to pass that all the host of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord to be observed in all the children of Israel in their generations. Notice that. What did God say to Abram? God said to Abram, I want you to know this. I've made a covenant with you with my people. It's going, your people are going to become a great nation. But first of all, they're going to have to serve a foreign nation in bondage 400 years. The people did go down the land of Egypt. They were there for 30 years and experienced good times under Joseph. Finally, they were put into bondage. The Bible says at the end of 430th year, guess what? In the very same, not even to the very day that they were placed into bondage, God brought them out of bondage in Egypt. That was God's promise to Abram. Listen, that reminds me that God's people are never alone and never forgotten. Remember that. It doesn't matter what the circumstances of life are. God's people are never alone and never forgotten. I'm sure those people who lived in Egypt for 300 plus years, many of them lived and died and do nothing but slavery. 
But that God's people were not alone and were not forgotten. God said to Moses, I've been looking at my people. I've been watching them. I know where they are, and it is now time for their deliverance. Remember, God will always remember his people and his promises in his time. Years may pass. Circumstances may change. But listen, God's word and God's covenant will never change. God's word and God's covenant will never stand, will never change. It will stand for eternity. Now with that in mind, let's go to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. Here we find Jesus and his disciples. Jesus is now eating the Passover meal with the disciples before his crucifixion. The same Passover that was ordained in the Old Testament. Jesus and his disciples now celebrate remembering God's covenant. God said, I'm making a covenant with my people. This is the sign of the covenant, the Passover, that I will pass over your home when I bring death throughout the land. As they were eating this Passover meal, drop down to verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. Quite a difference in the old Passover. Quite a difference. Notice the next verse, verse 27. He took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament. New Testament means new covenant. God's making a new covenant with his people. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. That's God's promise. God made a new covenant with his people. Jesus gave, you'll notice, read through the carefully. Jesus gave the bread and the cup, the wine of the cup, as the signs of the new covenant. Do you notice that? He gave them the bread, said, This is my body. He gave them the cup and he said, this is my blood. It's a new test. It is a new covenant. Just as the Passover had been a sign of the covenant, now what we call the Lord's Supper is a sign of a covenant that God has made with his people. Now I want you to note in the new covenant or in the new Passover, the Lord's Supper, there is something quite obviously missing. In fact, the most important ingredient in the Passover is missing. Did you catch it? Remember what it was? The Passover lamb. In the new covenant, there's no Passover lamb. In the old covenant, the lamb was the most important ingredient <laughs> in the covenant. In the new covenant, there is no lamb. There's the bread and there is the cup. And you know why? The reason is that Jesus Christ became the Passover lamb. You remember John the Baptist, the beginning of Christ's ministry? Remember what John said? Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Jesus Christ became the Passover lamb for his people. Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins. Notice, his blood was given at Calvary. Now today, follow me closely, today those who confess their sins, that's not enough. Those who confess their sins, repent of their sins, that means says, God, I'm so godly sorry. <laughs> those who confess they have sinned and repent of their sins and invite Jesus Christ to come into their heart, guess what? The Bible teaches us that by faith, by faith, when I invite Jesus Christ to come into my heart, the blood of Jesus Christ is sprinkled by faith upon the doorpost of my heart. The blood of Jesus Christ by faith is sprinkled upon the doorpost of my heart. You say, so what? So what? Follow me closely. In the land of Egypt, during the night, after the Passover meal, the death angel passed through Egypt. Every home, every home 
that did not have the blood upon the doorpost, death entered into that home. The people had been warned. We have been told in the New Testament that once again death is going to pass through our world. The Bible tells us that every person, every person who by faith confesses their sins, repent of those sins, receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they have the blood of Jesus Christ sprinkled upon the doorposts of their homes. And on that day when death once again passes through our world, every single person who does not have the blood of Jesus Christ by faith applied to their life are going to experience death. And it's going to be death by a burning, literal hell fire. That's what God's covenant is. God's covenant, my Passover. I am establishing a Passover. It is a covenant. It is a promise that my body was given. My blood was given. And when by faith we receive Jesus Christ, our, our life is covered by the blood. And on that day when Jesus Christ returns again, our life not only is going to be spared, we're going to have life eternal in God's kingdom. Every person who has never accepted Jesus Christ are going to experience literal death in a literal burning hell fire. That's God's covenant. And remember, God's people are never alone. I don't care what it looks like in our world. It may look like our world is, is gone to pot. Everything has gone haywire. But remember, it looked like that in Egypt too. It looked like God had lost all control, but he hadn't. And let me tell you this morning, in God's time and in God's way, Jesus Christ is going to return. And when Jesus Christ returns according to God's Passover, the new covenant, every one of us can be saved and have life in the kingdom of God. Years have passed, centuries have passed since that covenant was given. Let me assure you this morning, Jesus Christ is going to return. We best make sure. We best make sure that our life has been covered by faith, by the blood of Jesus Christ. If not, if not according to God's word, there's no hope of eternal life in God's kingdom. That's God's promise. That's God's covenant. I can't tell you when that day will be. I know it's coming because God's word says so. Let me tell you this morning, you know if you're ready for that kingdom. You know today in your heart if you've confessed your sins, if you've repented of your sins, if you've invited Jesus Christ into your heart, and if you're not ready if you're not ready, I'll tell you something else. You know that too. And the Holy Spirit is going to be convicting your heart this morning and give you an opportunity to confess and to repent and receive Jesus Christ. You've been warned. The covenant is given. Jesus will return. Are you ready? You know if you are. Let's pray. Before I pray this morning, there may be some here today who are not really sure. You're not ready for the coming of Christ, and you know that. The covenant's been given. It will be fulfilled. If you'd like to make a commitment of your life this morning to Jesus Christ, if you'd like to say today, Lord, I do want you to come into my heart, by faith, I want my life covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. I want to know that I'll be saved when Jesus comes back. Raise your hand and take it in. I'll pray for you as we pray together. Amen. Yes. Anyone else? Yes. As I pray together this morning with you, for all those who raised your hand this morning, by faith, right now. 
Won't you just commit your life to Jesus Christ? The Bible declares that we have all sinned. Just admit that. Admit that and say, Lord, I want you to forgive me my sins. I want you to come into my life. I want to know right now, today, that I'll be ready when you come again. Father, for every hand that's been upraised right now, I pray in Jesus' name. I pray in Jesus' name that his hearts are open and his confession is made to Christ and his repentance is made toward Christ. I pray that by faith, the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse from every sin. May there be that divine assurance right now today. I know that I know that I know that I'm ready. I'm ready for the coming again of Jesus Christ. Father, we know that you always keep your word and for those who have prayed this morning this prayer of faith, right now, the life is covered by the blood of Jesus. We're ready for your coming. Lord, as we share together now around the table, as we share in this covenant of the Lord's Supper, may we be encouraged and strengthened through Christ our Lord. Amen.